so the next part of this session is the first semester scan and I thought I might do something slightly differently because in previous congresses we have covered the anatomical assessment of 11 to 14 weeks but what I want to focus on is much earlier in the first trimester is the scan of 6 to 10 weeks of gestation particularly the 10 week scan because that's the time that we draw blood for free fetal DNA, DNA analysis in our unit and I want to do is to share with you is what is possible at such an early stage in gestation. It's important before we draw blood to ensure that the pregnancy is viable, whether single or multiple, or whether there are complications with fetal malformation or in increased nuchal translucency. In those scenarios where there's malformation or increased nuchal translucency, we will use both 2D and color, uh, but for most it's just a 2D examination at end of vaginal scan. With regard to the next patient who's coming in, Brianna, as a member of staff, has asked me to look with colour in the heart, but that would not be routine in a, a, a pre and IPT scan. With regard to the technical setup, slightly different to 11 to 14 week scan in that we proceed routinely directly to an end of vaginal scan because at 10 weeks, uh, most of the information is going to be obtained end of vagina because it's so early in the pregnancy. And the two pros which you use are the five to nine or the six to 12, and that depends on a general assessment of the patient's uh, BMI. We would finish up in patients where we were not able to get a nuchal translucency at 10 weeks or earlier by going to a transabdominal scan. And the choices there would be a probe this far as two to nine megahertz, a curvilinear or a nine linear, a much higher frequency probe in a patient who was a pre and IPT scan who declined, who did not want an end vaginal scan who, or who we were unable to obtain a nuchal translucency, which happens from time to time. And I'll talk about ways to get around that with an endovaginal with 3D. So I might bring Brianna in and we will proceed straight to an endovaginal assessment of a 10 week embryo. So, number one, I've selected the probe, which is obstetric first semester. And next I reduce the depth. As I sweep across, I see here's the amniotic sac just here and here's a salomic space. And you can see the amniotic sac is sort of a pure black, where you can see echoes in the salomic space. And they can actually make that a little bit more prominent by turning up the gain. Um, and seeing that hypochoic amniotic sac is very important because if there's an anterior abdominal wall defect or acrania, then that becomes hyperechoic. It's one of the markers for acrania. So as I look through the baby from head to toe, I'm sweeping on an axial section, and that's a very uh, important thing to do as a general anatomical sweep of 10 weeks because it gives you a lot of information. So I'm just going to toddle zoom very slightly. I'm going to increase my dynamic range just a fraction and then take down my gain. And as I do so on the sweep, I see that both hands are held across together in the midline, which is a very common position for babies to be in the 10 weeks. Sweep down and I see the outflow tracks, the pulmonary artery, the aorta, I'll come back to that, four chamber heart and the stomach. We can see here the cord insertion down onto the baby's legs. And it's very common at 10 weeks for the feet to be juxtaposed to each other. And um, it's the later on between now and 12 weeks, you get eversion of the foot and then the normal perpendicular position of the foot to the lower legs is established by 12 weeks. So that's why you need to be very cautious about making a call of talipes at 11 weeks. Because at 10 weeks, almost all fetuses look as though they've got talipes because the soles of the foot are juxtaposed. When you look at the digits, it's also much harder to see the digits of the feet when compared to the hands. You see the two bones of the lower leg, which is the fibula and the tibia, and you come up here to the femur, come up to the cord insertion, the abdominal wall. Out here is the yolk sac. You come up to the stomach, you come up to the four-chamber view of the heart, and then onto the baby's face. The mandible is one of the first bones to ossify, and you can see the mandibular gap here, which is a normal part of the development of the mandibular rami before they join. And then up to the maxilla just here. And this here is the zygoma on each side. And then if you look at the orbits of the eyes, you can see the lenses inside the orbits of the eye. So this little circle is the lens of the eye on this side. This little circle is the lens of the eye on this side. Come back to real time. That's worth just slightly increasing your dynamic range. And that will improve the visualization of both of the uh, lenses in the fetal eye. If you come around to the fetal head, there are various sections which we look at in the fetal head. Number one, you see the falx, this goes all the way anteriorly. We just rewind that, and you see the choroids fill the lateral ventricles. Ossification of the frontal bone is one of the first signs of um, 
on one of the very uses of clues in excluding a crania because failure of that ossification is one of the clues. And it just begins to ossify on a very small proportion of the frontal bone anteriorly, just from here to here. And that's nice to see that. And you come down from that and you see the third ventricle. And the aqueduct is quite striking at this stage. And it sits right beside the occiput. And then down below that again further, we have this rhomboid-shaped structure here in fluid, which is the fluid of the fourth ventricle. And the echogenic tissue posterior to that is the roof of the fourth ventricle. So as we come down on that, you can see the ears on the side of the fetal head. And if we look at the maxilla and the mandible, we can split the image by showing the maxilla on one part of the image there. The importance of that is that the lip is continuous across the maxilla, so there's no sign of facial clefting. And then we split the image and then demonstrate the mandibular rami. So this is the mandible with the gap between the mandible. And it's nice to save that as a single image onto your system. Go back, starting all over again, and as I do so, the fetus is turned over, and we can look through the fetal back. As we do so, looking through the fetal back, we can see the fetal kidneys, and they appear as tiny little echogenic clump of tissue. So this is the fetal kidney just here, and it generally measures around about three millimeters in length at this stage. And you can see the kidneys on both sides. And if you look with slow flow technology, you can actually identify the renal arteries coming in to supply the kidneys. I'll just have a quick look with that and turn on to slow flow. And then for slow flow, you select your map of four, the background on, and go for radiant flow max. And as you do so, you narrow it down because you want to minimize any exposure. And then coming back onto that, onto a 2D, a 2DC. So I'm looking at 2D and color. And the reason I do that is because I'm actually looking at the left side of the screen. That's where I want to see the kidneys. You can see the little vertebral arteries showing in there. But as what I'm actually focusing on here is the kidney, three millimeters in length. And here's my renal artery. So I'm looking at my left screen and my, just on the right side, the renal arteries will, will come up on view. So as I come across on that, I can see the renal arteries on both sides. And here's the other uh, renal artery. So normal appearance to the renal tract at this early stage. Again, color off because I don't want any more exposure than I need. And then I'm up to the humerus and then onto the radius of nomna. And you can see the radius and nomna here, side by side, and the humerus and the hands held juxtaposed to each other. The thumb is held in a different plane to the digits of the fingers. And coming across here, you can see the little tips of the digits on each side, confirming the presence of a normal digit count. Back to the head, if we look to the sections of the head, you can divide those into four sections. So we come across the very first section of the head, shows the fox. The next section shows the third ventricle. The next section shows the aqueduct of Sylvius. And the next section then shows the fourth ventricle. And there are the four sections, which are very different in appearance to the four sections of the brain at 12 to 13 weeks. If you look here, this is the aqueduct, sits right beside the occiput. So what happens in a sense is the cerebral peduncles, which are here, I'll label them CP, is that they, they get pushed forward between um, 10 weeks to 12 weeks where they sit here. And that's, a, that's an important landmark which I'll be talking about in my um, first semester uh, fetal brain talk. So let's continue. As we do so, the fetus, as you can see, is moving inside the amniotic sac. And as it is moving, it's an opportunity for the mother to see the baby on real-time 3D. So we select 4D in the top left-hand corner. You select the region of interest. I like to include the amniotic sac. I put my quality up to max. And my angle, I put around 55 degrees, which should be enough. And with the fetus moving then, you have to translate through into the sac to bring the fetus into view. And then around the y-axis rotation, and as you do so, you can now look through the amniotic sac. And you can see here is the salomic space, and here is the amniotic sac. And if you wish, you can change that into a more realistic setting um, of HD Live. So as I do that, I have to take off my arrow to get back my controls of light. And as I do that, I can magnify the image I have on light. Little z-axis rotation, and I can see as I look here, this is the umbilical cord coming out of the abdominal wall, the multiple loops of the cord, and then it's setting into the placental surface. And then rotate around your y-axis, and then you can see a little bit more definition of the anterior abdominal wall. Similarly, if you want to take some of the echoes relating to the fetal head out of you, you can come around and magic cut these echoes out as well. Again, a slight delay because this is much slower frame rate when compared to doing this um, in 3D magic cut. 
If the fetus moves into a cut area, obviously that will disappear from the screen. And now you have in real time 3D, you can edit your light and move the light source around. And what does that tell you? Well, number one, you can look at the feet, proportional size. Two, you can see both of the, the feet juxtaposed. Three, the legs. Four, two are to determine gender. Court insertion looks fine. Position of the hands, typical, held across the chest, fingers right beside each other. And I can see what looks like a fairly normal looking fetal profile. There are some echoes which are in my way just here, which I might just, um, if I'm lucky enough, if the fetus doesn't move on me, I might just remove these echoes as well. And then just show a little bit more definition. There's the arm and back around. Now I've got the elbow in view now. So it just gives you a nice definition of the shoulder, elbow, forearm, and also coming up to the fetal head, portion of the fetal head to, in relation to the fetal body. So that's just showing it in 4D. And the advantage of 4D is you do it, you can see the fetus move. And as you do that in real time, it gives you the power of resolution, accepting that it's 4D, but you can make out the individual fingers of the left hand and uh, that there are five fingers and a thumb in that single sweep. So that's 4D. And when I'm looking at um, the fetus through the back here, I'm looking also at the ribs. So if I magnify that image, you can see the yolk sac. And as I look at the rib length, I can see the spinal cord. There are no cystic lesions at the base of the spine. I travel, I see the iliac crest on each side. This is down onto the hips. And then up to the scapula, quite hard to see this very early stage in gestation. Now I'm going to come into the examination of the fetal heart. For this session <coughs> setting, I will go into a menu where I select a map of ice, and then I'll select a map which is a more contrasty map, which I do use for cardiac imaging on this particular system. It's a, a listed as a, a, a map 11. And next I will reduce my sector width. So I go back to main, and I'll take down my sector width, and I narrow that. And as I reduce my sector width, I just want to catch the forward chamber, and then next is on to depth. And from depth, then I use HD zoom. So I generally try to avoid total zoom. Once I've got that, I can pull back a little bit on my gain, and then I can increase my dynamic range. And now what I'm looking at here is the descending auto, defining the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and the right atrium. I can split my screen, and if you look at this, the heart generally measures around about four to five millimeters. This stage of pregnancy, so that's 4.7 by 4.4. So it's about half the size which you would see it in an anatomy scan at uh, 12 to 13 weeks. And then as you sweep, you can then get your outflow track. So if you look here, you have your pulmonary artery, your aorta, and uh, here's your PA, here's your aorta, and here's your SVC. And if you look at the size of these vessels, these vessels are in proportion to what they should be for this stage of pregnancy. And then you come back out of that onto a four chamber view of, of heart. And again, if you look at the newer technologies, you can see the definition that you get. Again, of inflow, again, pulling back on our power and, and pulling back on our gain. So I've reduced my power to 80% here, and I'm pulling back on my 2D gain, power back a little bit further. And I split my image, and I see here the ventricular inflow, and as I do, and then I go to ventricular outflow. And as I do so, I can see my branch pulmonary arteries, I can see my aorta, and, and PA, and SVC. So you can see nice definition of, of the individual tiny vessels. As you come up even higher onto the looking across, you can see the subclavian arteries. And as you increase your power across here, you can see the definition of your subclavian artery and of your vein uh, going out to your right arm. So if we look here, this is the uh, subclavian artery posteriorly and the subclavian vein uh, anteriorly. And similarly here, subclavian artery here, and subclavian vein positioned anteriorly. Abdominal wall, and you can see there's uh, quite a um, uh, it, it's a common finding at 10 weeks, you will see bowel herniating to the base of the cord, so it looks quite plump or thickened to the anterior abdominal wall. And as you look at this here, you can see the normal appearance to the cord coming in and inserting into the abdominal wall. I continue my anatomical survey. I just check to see where I am as I run through things, starting off the baby's legs and down onto the feet. They're actually separated now. And uh, two balls of lower legs, we've looked at the femur, we've looked at the cord insertion, we've seen the stomach, we've seen the four chambers, we've seen the outflow tracts. We've now come down to the humerus and the radius and the ulna. So if I just rewind that, you can see here, this is the radius and this is the ulna. I know we've seen the, the fingers at the very beginning of the examination, but you can see the proportion of the size of the right and left arm. And as you then come up uh, further, you can see the humerus. 
So at this stage, the bones are really beginning to ossify on both sides. And then a little bit of dynamic range, as is always helpful looking at the long bones, is you can actually see the individual bones of the, the fetal fingers. So if you can see the thumb, you can split it if you wish. You can have see the tips of the digits, and then you can have you put your thumb in a, in a different plane. Actually, the thumb in this case has actually come very nicely in for me in a single plane. Um, we've examined the kidneys, spine, um, up onto the shoulders, the four sections of the brain, and I still haven't shown you any nuchal translucency measurement. I will have a look at this abdominally, but as I come back on this, one other quick way, in a sense, when you're stuck with a, and this is quite frequent in, in, in a 10-week scan that you can't get a nuchal translucency, you can simply do a 3D acquisition. I'll still keep my quality max, I think I will get away with it. If I feel the features are moving a lot, well, I'll pull down my quality, my acquisition will be quicker. Hold your breath, five, four, three, two, one, and we see a little bit of movement. So what I'm interested to know is, is what does a nuchal fluid look like? Now I know it's not the world's best acquisition plane I've chosen, but what I want to do is to go to a multiplanar. And as I do in a multiplanar, I can then turn around on my x-axis, and as I do so on my x-axis, then on my z-axis, take my image, and then I'm just going to magnify it up. I then use what's called VCI. Now this is volume contrast imaging. And this well, I could take down to a, a, a thickness of one millimeter, which is probably just about, I mean, I prefer if it went down to 0 0.5 millimeters at this early stage. Pull back on the gain a little bit, and then go to contrast, increase contrast just slightly, and then the brightness I can pull back on. And then on this measurement, I can take a nuchal translucency. So you thought there wasn't any way you would have gotten that, cr that coronal acquisition on 3D, but actually you've got quite a representative and nuchal translucency. And you can see also you have a measurement of your fourth ventricle, which is quite a large structure. And then coming up here, you have your aqueduct and your third, which you can see are, these are all quite striking structures at this stage in pregnancy. And from that, you can then move to taking tomographic ultrasound slices, take it down to 0 0.5 millimeters. And you can see you can take a nice crown rump length measurement if you wish. Again, because sometimes it can be quite difficult at this stage in pregnancy. Next, as you come back down on this, I'd like to have a look at the placenta. So the placenta is here in the posterior wall. It's regressed along the anterior wall. And no comment to be made about the placenta covering the cervix. That's normal for this stage. I look for any perigestational hemorrhage. We measure the sac size. And you can see that there's a single yolk sac. If you ever see a second yolk sac, obviously be suspicious about the possibility of twins. And looking at the size of the sac and the coelomic space to me looks absolutely fine. You can track the cord as well as to where the cord inserts. And we sort of saw that really on 3D before we looked at it in 2D. But that's the point of the cord inserting into the abdominal wall. So it's just plumb in the middle of the placenta. So it's a very easy, in a sense, of picking up velamentous insertion of the umbilical cord. From here, I can move up to the point where the cord inserts into the abdominal wall. As I do so on a, on a slow flow, back to selecting a map of four, background on, and radiant max. You can see that the, the vessels in the cord at this early stage in pregnancy pull back on the 2D gain. And as we do so, we see both arteries um, present. And that's nice to have that peace of mind. Not uncommon to see the bladder, there's no urine in the bladder at a 10-week scan. So that's not something that I would be concerned about. More importantly is just to see the point where the cord inserts into the abdominal wall. Show you that view of how readily visible the kidneys are at this stage in pregnancy. Um, and you can see both kidneys just there and a nice, almost beginning to see a renal pelvis here at this stage. So kidneys re readily identifiable at a 10 scan. As I say, measure around about three millimeters. Since the baby is nice and still and a little bit easier, I might just go back and show you the renal art because they are very easy to see. And you can actually see the super renals as well. Um, if you just increase your sensitivity a little bit, you can see the super renals coming off. And there's your super renals coming off on the left and right side, just here, super renal and renal, super renal and renal. So as we have a look ab ab um, abdominally, um, you can see that the uh, nuclear translucency is much easier to obtain at an abdominal image. But before I do that, I do a sweep. So I do a sweep from top to bottom. I've know I've done a sweep uh, vaginally, but still, it's a good thing to do. And then do a sweep from left to right to make sure there are no cysts sitting high in the fetal abdomen and then go back to the embryo. And as I do so, I'm just going to take a, a HD zoom on that. And as I do so, I can see here my fourth ventricle. Um, 
which appears normal. I can see the beginnings of the nasal bone, normal looking profile. The head is flexed on the chest, which is normal for this stage of pregnancy.